Good morning. Good morning. We will call this meeting to order, um, this work session for order. Thank you for being here today. Uh, public comment clerk, I believe we have three citizens who have signed up for public comment this morning. The Board of Commissioners welcomes our citizens' comment. It is my goal to make sure that these meetings run smoothly and efficiently in order for the government, government to be effective. In this vein, I ask everyone to follow the rules of the body as directed by the chair. I also ask that everyone please assist me in keeping order in this room during this deliberative process so that our citizens' time, including those watching on TV, and uh, other, and our time is not fruitless. We definitely don't want our time to be fruitless. When I give a warning about timeliness or request order, I ask that you observe it. If I give a second warning about timeliness or request for order and the same is not observed, I will ask our sergeant of arms, meaning law enforcement, to for, uh, restore order to this room. You have three minutes um, to speak this morning, so when you hear the buzzer, we try to help you to stay focused. Uh, we have a three-minute buzzer, so when you hear the buzzer, uh, please just wrap your sentence up for me. Just wrap it up, and we'll go from there. So I will start. Our first citizen this morning is Mr. Larry Pierce. Ms. Pierce, please come forward. Please state your address, and I believe your subject of matter this morning is the coroner. Larry Pierce, 4120 Van Sant Road, Douglasville, Georgia. Good morning, everyone, and I'm sorry I'm in disguise <laughs> had a little accident trying to push a piece of tin on the roof and it came back at me and nine stitches later so uh, and all the jokes have been done but I have one more to say this is proof that in two years that I've been working on these issues if you put your nose where it don't belong you will get it cut off but I'm not Pinocchio either. Get it? All right. Now, today is a good day. And the reason it's a good day is because it's two years since I've been up here. Two years I've been coming up here to let y'all know what I've been doing. And ironically, it's so stated. Now, there's a lot of rumors going around. And I am the best hound dog when it comes to rumors you can imagine. So I want to set the record straight, plus it's being recorded. Fellow citizens, I want you to pay attention to this. I'm going to need your help later. On Wednesday of last week, I was served with a stocking order from Mrs. Godwin. Yeah. Madam Chair, right. point, point of order. <coughs> is, is this yeah. appropriate to talk about? A pending, this is not the appropriate platform for that. What did you say? This is not this the appropriate the, platform. I got it, Vice Chair. Well, this is not the appropriate appropriate platform for you to discuss that, Mr. Peters. We need, you know, that's really it, it has to do with what I've been doing for two years. Yeah, but you can't discuss that, that piece. Okay. okay. Well, anyway, I'm scheduled to go to court Wednesday. Okay. All right. But what I would like to talk about then is I'm going to be escorted out because she's coming up here to speak and I will be leaving the premises because of a conflict the, the way it's written up, okay? So uh, I can't stay like I usually stay for an hour or two. But what I do want to say, do what? It ain't through three minutes. <coughs> That's okay. Not okay. That was okay, so what I want to say is that when she speaks, and Mr. Bussey's here, please, she's the one that's a corner, not Mr. Bussey. She needs to speak, and y'all need to ask her questions about what she's doing, including the last time she got $25,000, of which it was five people that were indigent, and so she only needed five or 6000 And remember, Larry Bussey is her assistant 30 hours a week. So this whole thing is going to come to a head sooner or later. And when it does, and it's over, I'm probably going to go back home to Hawaii, where the hell I don't know why I left. <clears throat> but I've been here a long time. And in 76, I was asked by the people in Martins, my friends, to come up here and do what I've been doing for two years because they didn't know how to do it. 
they didn't have the time to do it, they didn't have the intelligence to do it, and they didn't care about doing it. So I just want to let you know that my heart has been here the whole time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Pierce. Mm -hmm. uh. Our next uh, citizen is Ms. Ingrid uh, Landis Davis. Ms. Davis, please come forward and give us your address and your subject matter. This corner as well, I believe. <coughs> Good morning. Ingrid Landis Davis, P.O. Box 875 Winston, but I also live in District 4, Commission District 4. Um, I'm sorry that Mr. Pierce had to leave because I wanted him to hear what I had to say about his behavior. I wasn't at the last Commission meeting, but I saw it on TV, and I was appalled that he accused the coroner of sending one of her deputies to Egypt on the county dime, just and waved around a piece of paper like it was evidence. Just really spurious accusations of this woman who has come in in the last two years and tried to upgrade and professionalize the coroner's office. It enough is enough. The man is off the chain, and somebody needs to rein him in. He's dangerous, and really. His, his ideas and his thoughts and all this stuff he's putting out, his, his stalking the coroner, the, she's a woman, and she's, she's scared of him. He's awful. And I wanted him to hear that. I'm sorry he had to leave, because I wanted to speak as a citizen, and I also represent other organizations and other women's groups. We've had enough of watching this man just tear this woman down constantly. She's been in office two years. The previous coroner came up here a few months back and said, I wasn't here, but I saw it on TV, and said, pointed his finger at the commissioner, at, at the chairman, and said, oh, shut up, don't say my name anymore, and all this stuff, because I'm retired. Now, you know, a few months later, he's announced that he's running for coroner again. But beyond that, I'm not bringing him in. I'm just talking about Mr. Pierce. <coughs> enough is enough. And I just wanted to make that statement. Oh, there he is. I just, I'm sorry you didn't hear what I had to say. I know my time is up. But what I really want to say, since the buzzer has it written, is you need to leave the coroner alone. Stop stalking that woman. This is National Women's Month. We just finished Black History Month. This woman is the first black female to ever hold this office. She is doing all she can to, to make this a great uh, position and do her job. That's all I got to say. Thank you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. <coughs> All right. Ms. Next we have Ms. Mary Go Edwards, and I believe your subject matter is meeting timer? Meeting times. Times. Meeting times. Okay. There you are. I was looking for you. Hello, everyone. I'm Mary Gold Edwards. I'm the CEO of uh, Shelter for Women in Crisis here in Douglasville, JC Freedom House. Um, uh, prior to um, doing that work, I sat on a number of national and uh, local uh, boards um, in the UK, where I'm originally from, and I want to commend <coughs> the Chair of Commissioners for making some of these meetings available in the evenings. But this particular meeting is not available in the evening. And in, in the, to make it more accessible to uh, people and to the, the community at large, it would be fantastic if some of the meetings could be scheduled for <coughs> the evening, just as the, the one tomorrow is. If just some of them could, it would make, it would, um, those that work during the day, it would give them the ability to make a contribution and just be part of the democratic process. So I commend the work that you're doing and the engagement that has already happened, but I would love to see, um, even if it was two or, or a couple of the meetings a year or something, where um, people that just can't make the, 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 the daytime meetings could attend. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Edwards. We definitely have stepped our game up. We were not hosting any meetings in the evening prior to this administration's arrival, so I'm excited to hear your concerns and and we'll see what I can do to maybe just 
stair step a few of the meetings in the evening, but I'll work with the Board of Commissioners because, again, but thank you again for that feedback, and we really appreciate you. Thank you so much. We'll move on to the next item. We have some presentations this morning. We have our courthouse security project update, and we have Mr. Stan Copeland here. Mr. Copeland, please come forward. <coughs> Morning, commissioners. How are y'all? Good morning. It's good, morning. good to be up here as part of the uh, business community in Douglas County. So, but my name is uh, Stan Copeland. Uh, I am um, a consultant for your program management firm for the Courthouse Security Project, Comprehensive Program Services. And uh, Madam Chair asked that I would come up and brief the Board of Commissioners and take any questions you might have about the project. So. Uh, very quickly, I didn't put together a PowerPoint, but I did give you um, a handout that uh, generally shows the new flow of the front project. Um, and just want to give you a little bit of update and then be glad to take any questions you might have. Uh, first of all, a little history on how this began. Um, in 2016, um, as you can well imagine, this courthouse was designed in 1996. Uh, as a split courthouse, which is, at the time, was probably not a bad design. Uh, but for modern day, it is a bad design. Let's just call it what it is. So, uh, the increase in the courts and the increase in the public, you can tell by the parking out there how much mm -hmm. the court has increased over the years. Um, it was, uh, they were having issues um, as far as security. Uh, potential lapses in security and uh, a free flow of people trying to get through the screening station because you have a single screening station. So, um, uh, one proposal that came out was to put screening stations at both the Truth and Liberty entrances. Um, uh, then Sheriff Miller came to the county, spoke with the county and said, look, um, that option uh, will require significant personnel, which is an ongoing cost that just continues and continues from now on. <coughs> Plus, it puts a little bit more burden on the sheriff's office to maintain the personnel that would take to screen both. He said, would you please look at other options? So CPS uh, was hired to do a needs assessment and a design assist to look at other options here at the courthouse. Uh, we spent, uh, a group uh, spent about nine to ten months working with the sheriff's office and the courts looking at other options uh, and um, what we could do to enhance the security here at the courthouse. And so that's kind of the history that brings you to where we are today. Um, this design was a, um, was a total issue uh, of what could be done in a reasonable budget, uh, understanding there was there's budget constraints, there's security concerns, and there's also a free flow. I don't know if y'all, I'm sure you've noticed people trying to get an in and out of court, uh, calling 200 jurors. You know, Judge Emerson is here and uh, was very concerned um, it, every time we met about uh, the sheriff's office screening people to get into the courts and the line going out. So. We had those two goals in mind, security and to enhance the ability to get people in and out of the court uh, in a timely manner. So, um, again, we think that this accomplishes both goals. Um, what this does, what this plan does, uh, and again, you have it in front of you, generally it will open up the front lobby that is now currently closed. It will open up the front lobby. <coughs> to allow multiple screening stations and one single point of entry and exit here at the courthouse. Uh, that does a couple of things. First of all, it puts everybody in full view of the sheriff's office and Captain West staff so they can have an eyeball on everybody that comes through. It also enhances her ability that during peak times that she can run multiple screening stations because they're not needed all the time. To, to man screening stations for a full work day would just be a waste of manpower. She can put the necessary people there 
to run multiple screening stations when there is a, a need or a peak time, and then she can send them off to other duties uh, when there's not that need. So that was kind of the goal. You have two package screeners and you have four screening lines that can now, once this is completed, that will be able to come through the courthouse. Um, this will, of course, uh, in order for security, require the closure of the truth and liberty entrances. Okay? Uh, that will be done electronically. Those doors will be closed on a mag lock and will be there for emergency exit only. Okay. They will be set up attached to the fire alarm system in case there's a fire alarm and there's also will be a manual release in the sheriff's office control room downstairs in case you have another type of emergency, an active shooter or some other emergency that doesn't trip the alarm. Uh, then people will still be able to exit the building um, as the fire marshal requires and as needed in this size building. So uh, we think that this, uh, this plan really enhances. Um, it, will, it, will you lose some convenience? Absolutely. And unfortunately, um, as I have to tell people, convenience is the enemy to security. If you don't believe it, go to the airport. Um, anytime you have an entry point or an exit point, that's an entry point and an exit point for people who want to do good and people who want to do bad. So uh, with this in mind, uh, this will be set up um, once it's uh, functional uh, and people kind of get in the free flow, uh, we think this will accomplish both goals, let people in and out of the courts. And it does help one convenience. Once the screening station is put up front, it will allow the board and the courts to open up the courthouse for free flow inside. I can't tell you how many times over my career I would talk to the public and they would say, uh, I, I need to go to the, the court, but I'm up here on the third floor. And you have to say, well, you go back downstairs and you go through the screening state. You know, you have to, it's a little confusing for someone first entering. Well, once everybody is screened there, you won't no longer have to do that. They'll have the free flow because everybody will be screened and they can come and go on the third floor and uh, back and forth and you won't have that so it will actually open up the interior so um, uh, I can discuss the secure parking um, but I'll just uh, why don't I just open it up and take any questions that you have and then that way maybe I'll know where to go thank you so much um, sister Copeland yes ma'am board of commissioners do you have any questions for Sam Copeland commissioner Guider yes uh, <coughs> Stan this drawing appears like there's two scanners uh, uh, instead of three. I thought there was going to be three. Yeah, there's actually four. Well, there's two package screeners, but there's four magnetometers. In other words, four lines for people to walk through because uh, the majority of people that come through, once they take, they, they don't have anything to screen. Uh, you know, they just some things in their pockets. So you can run, and the package screeners are quick enough with dual two of them running, that they'll be able to screen the packages necessary. Uh, and with the employees, would you explain uh, the process for them? Yes, ma'am. Uh, employees will have, uh, at the screening station, there will be a separate entry for employees, similar to what you have now, but it will be a, um, it will be a kiosk that they go through. Right now, uh, employees tend to piggyback. Uh, I've seen it. The, here at the courthouse, Captain West has seen it. The door, we're polite people, hopefully. We're raised to be polite. So you see someone, you scan your card, you open the door, and you see three people behind you, and you hold the door for them. And that's what's happening down at the screening station. Well, the general idea is to screen or to key card all the employees as they come in. That leaves a record of their entry into the courthouse. This will be what they call a slip kiosk, which will do that. It will not allow piggybacking. You'll have to screen yours, you'll go through, you'll screen yours, you'll go through in full view of the sheriff's security staff. Are they scanned? Uh, no, they will not be scanned. They will have, it will be beside, so they will not go through screening. Okay, uh, in all the news, yes, it's always a disgruntled employee that right. is 
come in the building and shot up the place. Sure. So why are the employees not going to at least go through a body scan? We did. We when when it was designed, we are designing it as the operation calls for today. The board of commissioners, the courts, and the sheriff can certainly require that, and this would not interfere with that. In other words, uh, you're right. Uh, there's many departments, federal department, many departments that require their employees to be screened as they come in. Uh, you know, my son's a pilot, so I can tell you at the airport, even the pilots and the flight attendants. <coughs> getting onto the jet have to be screened so but that's an operational it, it doesn't really affect this was set up so the um, county could make that decision to whether they wanted employees screened or not be screened. Uh, I don't remember us talking about this uh, in our meeting uh, about the employees but no, to me, this is a big concern. Well, they're not screened now, Commissioners. The reason it was designed that way. I know, but in the recent news, sure. that's what you see. It's a disgruntled employee. Sure, absolutely. And, and so, uh, I mean, I love our employees. Sure. But, you know, the reality is reality. Right. But uh, it just seems like a big loophole in the security. But uh, we'll, I'll go on. Uh, we were concerned, I me mean, and the chairman, <laughs> were concerned that we were closing off the the truth or liberty uh, right. uh, entries because the way the parking is, it's wrapped around, and a lot of times our employees they go to lunch, they come back, and then, and then they got to go back through this, and um, you know there's technology out there, clear, where they read your eye or your your fingerprint or something right. like that. And then, then the bars, like they do at the subway in uh, in New York, you know, where only one person can go through at a time. Um, uh, it just seems like we could open up at least one of these entries for the employees, right. so that they don't have to. We're funneling everybody into the front entrance. Right. So it's it's going to increase <coughs> the load of people coming through the front entrance. And, um, you know, on a rainy, cold uh, day and everything, uh, <clears throat> if someone has to park way well on the Liberty side, right. for instance, and have to walk all the way around, they're going to be, they're going to be fussing at us. <laughs> well, it is, it, uh, Commissioner, it is an inconvenience, and I will tell you that to begin with. However, anytime you give your employees a separate entrance, that is not manned by security staff, you make them a potential target. Um, anytime I give you a key to something, then you're a potential target for someone that wants to enter the courthouse illegally. A card key is still a key, no matter what. A card key, it's only a key that keeps a record. That's all a card key is, but it's still a key. So if you have a key to another entrance uh, and uh, the sheriff's office allows you and the court and the commissioners allow you to come in, then it makes you a potential target. Where coming in the front lobby, that's much less likely because you have a security staff overseeing that mm -hmm. uh, as far as them coming in. Well, they can see you come in the front entrance, but they can't see what you've got in your coat. No, and again, that goes back so. to the screening process as far as your employees. That is certainly, uh, that's done on many courthouses throughout the country. But that's an operational issue that the board and the courts and the sheriff would have to address. Uh, you got a lot of employees in here, so if you're screening them coming in and out, that certainly enhances your security. But it also um, it, it also creates a time issue. Um, it adds to it where here they're not doing it now. So that's the reason it was set up that way. But uh, it just seems like with the technology that's available out there and then the bars that only allows one person right. at a time to come through. It just seems like we could do that with one bailiff to make sure everybody's adhering to the rules <clears throat> and then pull their card if they break the rules. Well, but the but a bailiff and or a deputy, <coughs> um, first of all, um, if you're allowing them, they have to, um, then you have an entry point 
to where you don't even need a card key, but still an armed, you know, you can't really use a bailiff for that if you're adding security. Well, I, an armed individual that wanted to take your card would just meet you out in the lobby, take your card, and make their entry through any other point. So uh, no security plan is perfect, um, but this is as close as you can get and puts at least you under the eye of a uh, of an armed sheriff's deputy uh, or several that are at the front screening station that would not be at the other points of entry. Okay, I, I just need you. We need to, I truly feel that we need to address uh, the employees because of the fact so many disgruntled employees are the cop. And I, I'm not saying that all of our employees are going to come in here and do this, but you know, you just never know how when you cross somebody, how they're going to take it and stay in time. It's, like you said, it's a new era. It is, and, and again, that's an operational <laughs> issue that the board can address and the courts can address. Yeah. Mr. Goddard, you know, I've been so, involved in this. Uh, could, you, could you go to the police force? <laughs> I was going to call on you anyway. You know, our chief security judge here, uh, David Harrison, is here this morning. I got 67 cases know. waiting on me, but okay. you know, in my view, we have to do the center entrance. That's not really uh, to do anything else. Guts the whole plan. It just opens it up. So the, the side entrance is just. It's well, it would be nice. It and it's just not going. It will gut the plan. Also, um, all of the, every security decision you all make is driven by cost. You all know how much your payrolls run, and you know, y'all can have three entrances if you're willing to spend the tens of thousands mm -hmm. for, the, for the people to man those entrances. Um, so that, like I say, all of this is a trade-off. This is the most efficient way for us to provide safety to, these, to all the other employees here in the building. And if you go to other courthouses, well, for example, I, you know, I go to downtown Atlanta and, and uh, sometimes and I walk to the Capitol, places like that, walking a half a block, which is about what you're talking about anywhere here, is not an inconvenience. I walk three or four blocks downtown Atlanta to get to a, a facility after I've driven around a parking deck. So we're really not imposing that much on folks to have to walk a few, about 100 feet further to get to the center entrance. As far as the employees go, you know, that's up to y'all as far as, you know, this is sort of a trade-off to keep what we've historically had, which is we have a card and we walk in and you walk up the type of thing he's talking about. You put your card over it and the, the rotator thing will open for you. And it's very open and very user-friendly, but only one person can go through. So I just say that we do support the recommendation uh, for the safety of employees as it's, as it's offered right now. And I think we got plenty of channels with four channels that will get people in the building, which is a consistent problem, especially on Mondays. Uh, as y'all know, this place is really busy today. Mm -hmm. just every day. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions from Judge Everson? No, Judge. Okay, no. Judge. All right, I got a lot of All right, thank you so thank much, Judge, for coming. Uh, Vice Chairman Robinson, I believe you have come in. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and, and Judge Everson took some of my, my, my thunder because I was at the Capitol last week and I had the, the honor of walking around in the rain and it's I don't see the inconvenience per se so I wouldn't I wouldn't spend a lot of time on that um, for employees but we've shifted right your, your, your life shifts your, your body shifts everything shifts you have to accommodate so I duly noted but but one of the things I did want to talk about if in fact there was um, some type of legislative I don't know what committee this might have fell under or whatever if y'all really want to debate that about what to do with employees, I'd love to have that with the full board of commissioners. Um, I just haven't seen anything. Um, but if there's a recommendation coming out of committee, um, bring it forward. Um, I, I think it's, it's worthwhile for us to sit here and talk about this. Um, employees, again, it's a class of citizens. I, I, anybody can have bad behavior. I, I won't just say employees alone. Um, it's just targets, no more than schools or anything else. It's, 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 it's I, I want to make sure that for the employees, our decision is not based on you being an employee that you'll be bad. Evil is not a respectable person. It's, it's, it's not relevant. Uh, but if in fact, if you want to protect against all, we, all one all, do all, that's fine. Um, I, I think going from what, one to four, we'll move it. 
they don't move fast enough, but again, it's a function of cost. Um, Security-wise, um, I guess my question, Chief, um, excuse me, Stan Copeland, is... Um, they call worse. <laughs> my bad, my bad. Um, really, it's, it's around the cost um, component. Um, cost and time. Yes, sir. Cost, did y'all have estimated part of this? Um, and then time, we think we're going to be done. Now, that is convenient, you know, uh, inconvenience for the citizens trying to get, um, you know, the front. How long is it going to take? Uh, we estimate about five months construction. Uh, as you since it was closed down, uh, we've given a contractually a window of 30 days, so it's a six-month contractual mm -hmm. obligation. But we estimate, luckily, <clears throat> most of this work is inside. Uh, I can tell you, I've been working on the Paulding County Jail, and um, uh, we've seen Noah up there two or three times working. So it has been tremendous. Uh, but luckily, most of this work is inside, so we believe we can make that five-month goal. Okay. Second part was cost. Where did you? Cost. Uh, I don't have the exact cost in front of me. Um, it's uh, about right uh, about 1.33 million. About right. It was like uh, <laughs> once the contract was issued to Barnsley, we were able to negotiate um, some value engineering without um, without hurting. Uh, security or hurting the uh, so we were able to negotiate it from about 1.5 uh, to about 1.33 uh, and that is for the inside work and the secured parking work. Okay. That, that's good enough. Mr. Copeland. Um, just to clarify County Administrator um, 1.3 did we budget that or this is how we yes sir it's budget. I yield. Thank you. Okay. Commissioner Mitchell. Yes. And, and, and along that line though um, and probably more of you Mark this 1.3 will, will come in under budget, but this is a turnkey. Yes. Okay. It yes. won't be one of those. May or may not be, but this is what this is it. Yes, that's a good okay. Unless we find something, uh, some bones, someone there. Right. Unless we're, we're, we're trying to figure out what that is. Okay. Um, you, you talked about the, the side exits. Yes. Um, and and when will those be permanently or, or closed once we get through the construction, construction, or kind of what's kind of the, the timeline? Okay. Once the once the sheriff's office is comfortable, we have everything set up up front. Mm -hmm. They are comfortable with the uh, process. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, we'll be leaving that up to them. The work will be done to secure the side entrances, mm -hmm. um, but it will be before they actually move from their present location mm -hmm. to the new screening station. Mm -hmm. It's once they're trained, feel comfortable that everything is working properly and all that. So we'll we'll work with Captain West to defer uh, to when she's comfortable that okay we've got this now. Got it. Yes. Sir. And once they once they close them off, they'll be closed off, and it'll be that'll be it. Yes. Sir. And, you, and you guys are able to manually <coughs> kind of unlock them for a fire hazard or a shooter or whatever the case. Yes, sir. Be. They'll work automatically with fire alarm. They'll, they'll right. automatically, right. and then if there's another type of emergency, control will be able to open them. So once once they're locked down, nobody can actually go out. Correct. You got because of the magnet or whatever that is. That Correct. We had to. Uh, we we couldn't do a hold open. In other words, open the door. Right. Let somebody in. Right. 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 So right. So once you once it closed off, once you, you guys will control that part of it. Correct. Now, uh, it was brought to my attention too, though, that okay, when when there's um, an election of some sort, that's kind of the, the route that those guys took, kind of exiting and lining up when when the big elections are coming. Right. But that will no longer be based on the mere fact of what we're going to be doing in the present. That will be. There will be the ability to unlock those doors. <coughs> I got will you. be there. So that's an operational issue. So uh, if you have the staff that can man that post um, right. uh, during certain special events. Right. Uh, uh, you'll still have the ability to open up the courthouse. Yeah. It will just not be done. It's kind of like the courthouse is now. Right. If you go after hours, mm -hmm. you can still unlock your front doors and mm -hmm. do things like that, and you will still have that ability to adjust as the need. It's just the daily operation would be like this. Okay, so we, 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 we. We have that ability to pull it off. So, yes, but I just know when those times comes, you know, the abundance of people that that's around during that time frame, that depending upon the election or the cycle, could be interesting. Yes, sir. Uh, okay, so um, four stations, and, and, and kind of give me that again. Four stations that we're feeding, 
before walk-through magnetometers like you have in two package screeners. So you'll have a package screener that serves two magnetometers. So you have a walk-through with a package screener, okay. then you have another two walk-throughs with a package screener. So you can you can open all four, you can open three, two, whatever is necessary yeah. based on uh, your peak times. Right, and, and, and we'll base that off of what, you, what you've seen like Monday. Right, historically, the yes. you know, judge calls 200 jurors. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, you have arraignments, certain yeah. state court and other arraignment days. Yeah. You have. Understood. Uh, yes, sir. Okay, and we'll, we'll base it on history and we'll, so that way we can kind of effectively, efficiently use our personnel, personnel to kind of right. man that, that kind of makeup. Uh, security cameras. The security cameras will be up front so you can kind of man that and see that. And, and somebody will be manning the security cameras. I, from my understanding, that is a yes, but I'm not sure. But somebody will, will see that in and out or it would just be recording at all times. No, central control has the ability to pull up multiple cameras, whether it be courtrooms or others, so uh, they will have that ability. There will just be a couple of additional cameras to go on the multiplexer. Mm -hmm. So they can <coughs> control people, can watch, mm -hmm. along with the deputies who can personally see what's going on. But yes, Got it. So Okay. And, and again, we talked about safety is first. And mobility, I would assume, is second. We try to get people around. Yes, sir. But, but I, I think if we keep that in mind, I think what we got and what we've actually kind of reviewed in previous years, and now we're actually getting ready to make this happen, I think this is probably the, the best route. The extra walk of 100 feet, 200 feet, mm -hmm. I think we'll, we'll get around it. I think in time, yes, sir. Uh, citizens will understand uh, it's about their safety, along with our safety <coughs> as well, uh, and, and the need for safety has, has been prioritized, yes, sir. you know, it's, it's the top of the list. And I think to make that extra walk through a rain or snow or, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll get to that. Though. But people, people are very, court is at a very emotional time. Right, right. Uh, along with other meetings that are uh, very emotional and emotions create or can create problems. So, right. yes, sir. It's, yeah. uh, and last but not least, with the, 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 the cards that in and out or keys or whatever we want to call them, um, we will definitely get a better control of those so when employees leave or come or we can discontinue these cards, you know, just by <coughs> a stroke of a, a keystroke, I would hope, and I'm not sure, okay, how that works. So that way, yes, when that does happen, right. whether they're disgruntled or not, we right. can discontinue their cards. Discontinue whether they turn them in or not, we can discontinue the card. So we, we've, got, mm -hmm. we've got control of the cards. Yes, sir. Even though we've handed them out, and a lot of us say, well, I lost, I don't know what, I don't know what the card is. Okay. Okay, we just click a button, I'm assuming, and turn yes, them off. That's so that way, that person can have access once they've been terminated from this particular operation. That's correct, yes, sir. Okay, thank you. I yield back. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Mitchell. Any other comment for commissioners? Thank you so much, Mr. Thank you. Copeland, for coming in. And the ultimate goal is to button this place up. Uh, we are, we need top security, and I appreciate it. And also, Board of Commissioners, we, may, uh, we need to sit down and talk about uh, enhancing that opportunity to make sure that our, our employees are screened. I don't want to just put deaf views on submission of guidance to comment, you know, because, you know, we do have a lot of these local place violence or activities where you see uh, employees that are disgruntled that come back. So I want to, I, I don't want to put a deaf ear. It sounds like it, it won't cost them additional, a lot of money to do that. Or Those can be locked down. Those kiosks can be locked down just as quickly as they can be opened up, Commissioner. Sounds like you have right. an opportunity. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you so much, and Thank we appreciate you. you. Next, we have um, the Atlanta Transit Link ATL proposed regional transit program list of proposed projects. Um, Miguel Valentin, Director Valentin, good morning. And thank you for being here. Uh, good morning, Madam Chair, good Commissioners. Morning. The, uh, the uh, item on uh, the overhead here on the uh, display. I don't think you're going to be able to see it from there. <laughs> I definitely can't. <laughs> but uh, certainly not all of you. Uh, but, but it is attached to your agenda. <laughs> <laughs> um, it is an attachment to the agenda item. So uh, okay. if you would, uh, the intent is to, uh, I'll now give you the background on this for you to review it over the next week or so and uh, take a look at what types of projects are on there. Essentially what's happening, uh, and I'll try to get out of the way a little bit for those of you that are trying to 
squint your eyes and read. Um, essentially, similar to the way the, the DOT and the Atlanta Regional Commission have a, a set of projects on the transportation side, the, uh, the ATL Atlanta Transit Link now is developing a list of projects on the transit side. So the types of projects would be uh, bus service, uh, it would be train service in those locations where they have it or are proposing it. Uh, it would be multimodal transportation um, ride share like we have here. And so we had discussion at the last uh, transportation committee meeting and uh, essentially the Atlanta Regional Commission is being um, sort of phased out in, the, in, in terms of the transit component and it's now going to be hand, handled through the Atlanta Transit Link, the ATO. So they have asked for us to submit a, a list of types of projects that the county may engage in over the next 20 to 25 years. Now, there's a number of uh, projects, type projects listed there. Not all of those we are going to necessarily engage in. None of them are we committed to, with the exception, of course, of the bus service that's already in the, in the program because it is an approved project. So uh, it, it will have a planning level budget for that, for each particular project. It would be things like once the first three years of the fixed bus route service ends, there would be the expectation that the county would consider extending that same type of service. Also, there could be uh, an assessment needed in terms of our, their other routes that are needed. Uh, demand response is a, an item that has been discussed over the years as part of the transit services analysis and uh, that certainly is a service that the county could, could consider. So again, this list is providing you uh, a, a two, two different categories. The one that's on the screen now is for the five or six year initial program. Uh, and it is, they've, they've requested that we include uh, target budgets, planning level budgets. There is a second page to this that has uh, what is typically referred to as long range plans, similar projects that would carry all the way to the year 2045. Uh, generally, there is an assessment period, a study and analysis that is done by uh, the agencies to develop the list, but in this particular case, because the ATL is coming online now as a new agency, they uh, haven't done that. They will be they will engage in that process uh, later this year. But they have asked to have all of the counties and agencies provide a list of the services that we provide now and those that we may think uh, we would be engaging in in the future. Uh, they've asked uh, for that information to be provided to them and we will be transmitting that information in the next uh, week or week and a half. But again, there is no commitment, there is no action item at this time uh, for the board. There is no commitment being made as a result of this. We're not applying for any uh, funding allocation at this time. It's just a list of potential transit projects that the county may consider uh, Initially, the five, five, six year period uh, where the funding has been uh, more or less uh, developed in terms of planning budgets and then the long range uh, types of projects that we may get into. Um, the ask for the commission is for you to uh, go through the list and review and, and look at the projects that are on there and see if there's other types of projects that you might want to add to the list and uh, then we'll make sure that to incorporate those. Thank you so much, Director Valentin. Uh, Vice Chairman Robson, you have a comment? Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, Miguel, confirmed that this was presented to, during the um, Transportation Committee? It was, at the last committee, yeah. yeah okay. Um, I, I thought it was prudent to bring this 
without a recommendation from the board of uh, Mark meeting to the full board commission because of its impact. Um, this is a major undertaking. Uh, the ask that he just presented to us but was for us to take a look at this list would be the equivalent of like, we would be making it up, right? Go back to the SPLOST. Go back to what was just asked is we got to do this in a week, right? I get there's a new agency. I understand how top down works. Uh, I, I don't want to, while I appreciate he has an administrative action that he has to take and, that, and I'm not um, against uh, uh, providing support for that, but I, I think some prudence needs to be given to this. If it's going to be for 10, 20, 30 years, let's be thoughtful. Um, I heard you say, you know, typically the ARC <coughs> has consulted an agency. I, mean, I heard you say study and analysis. This is not about you, Miguel. This is, I'm talking about you. Uh, usually there's some type of study and analysis. If we're going to do this, do this right, lay it out, even if it's a plan, even if it's unfunded, there needs to be some thoughtfulness to it. Uh, one of the things that we, we learned from the broader ATL and the Georgia's approach to transportation is just it chose not to think about it. It chose 30 years not to partake of it, right? It just, uh, with, uh, I mean, ideology, whatever it was, it chose not to pursue it. Well, here we are now, part of an ATL, part of the broader <coughs> like, okay, can we be a little bit more deliberate? Can we lay out a real plan? Um, and uh, what that means, I mean, and again, all it is is consideration. It's not an obligation to your point. We're just trying to, let's be thoughtful about the 8th district. Uh, let's be thoughtful about the things that may impact us, which is, you know, that's our district part of ETL. What does that mean um, as it relates to leveraging, as you hear me talk about leveraging our capital stack, uh, you know, obviously local to the state, the county. Well, let's make sure that we align ourselves whatever we're going to do. Um, um, and I, I'm thinking, you know, South Fulton and South Cobb and all of Douglas represents the 8th district. So if I'm sitting here, I'm like, okay, let's, let's line this thing up. Let's, let's, let's make sure we're aligning ourselves on where things may be going, but follow the floor of the war. You know, but follow it where it goes. Um, again, to my peers, I'm talking about this with you together. Um, I think this one we need to think about. I mean, put your projects in. Um, I mean, I, I guess the list is the list, right? You submit it. Um, and it will be an official baseline. Mm -hmm. So my question becomes, because anything you submit becomes, just like the SPLOS list, it becomes that thing becomes forever. Just by default, excuse my commission mentioned, mm -hmm. by default it becomes a list. So I want to know how flexible this is. It says that because we're shotgunning. And I'm okay with that. We got a baseline, but it's like, but once we get perhaps a, a consultant or study here, to become more refined, and now I've got this baseline out here. How easy is it for me to be able to shift that? That's that was my commentary, and that's my question. How easy is it to, to change? And again, it's not going to be changing everything that you submitted, but there may be some deliberate things that we need to change. Yeah, no, no question about it, Commissioner. This is not intended to be uh, the list that we're going to go by for the next however many years. It's really intended for the Atlanta Transit Link uh, staff to be able to take a look at what is happening uh, at the various counties throughout the metro area and to make an assessment as to uh, perhaps how to link those services, right. how to connect and maybe there are gaps in service. And so they, they just want a baseline initially as a planning tool. Uh, they will be engaging in a more deliberate study, a more deliberate uh, analysis, just like one of the items on, on here, one of the projects that, that we've listed is for us as a county to engage in a transit services needs analysis update, like the one that was done uh, in 2015, I believe. Mm -hmm. So um, all of the counties, all of the agencies periodically will have uh, their own assessments. Uh, Fulton, in fact, <coughs> it, it has, just, has just gone through the process of wrapping up their transit services analysis. And, and we will at some point in, in the future. So it is not a uh, written in stone document. It is a planning level initial cut, initial look. And it is uh, um, adjustable just pretty much like you would a uh, uh, your your budget uh, or your capital improvement plan at the county. We have a five-year plan, and, and we you know we have a list of projects, and some of those are able to be moved forward, and others not. And a year later, or perhaps even 
less than a year later, you revisit where you are and you recalibrate. Uh, the same thing will happen with, with this. No, I appreciate that. And I, I think to that point, what's important, I know ATL is a planning. They're planning for the, the entire 10 districts, 13 counties. Um, <coughs> my, my concern is that with, with their planning in this master plan, that Douglas County doesn't get um, our voice dealt to, to us. In other words, we want to make sure we get input out of the 8th district. And even while I appreciate the 8th district, I'm all things Douglas, right? So that means that we need to have our own character area, how we think transit should be out here. Because again, that's a metro. And I'm going to be clear for the record, like, no, we got our own character area. You know, I, I, while I appreciate uh, what transit means to different people, different things, I think we can do it in a way that will we'll, we'll maintain the way we see the world um, transit our way. So you've heard me say that on record and say that down there. But uh, I'm sure I just want to make sure we don't lose sight of the need to do a study for, for Douglas. Mm -hmm. uh, but that was all. Thank you. Yeah. You hear that? Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Carlton. Uh, Director Miguel, my question to you is, is this plan in a certain order? Is it an order of priority? No, not at all. In fact, it is... It is taking uh, the more obvious things that a, that a transit <coughs> agency would typically engage in, such as replacement of existing <coughs> vehicles. Uh, the type of services that we have now, we realize that th there is a federal mandate that periodically you replace uh, your, your uh, equipment, your vehicles. And so we anticipate that as, as we continue to provide those services, we would have to have the means of replacing vehicles, of continuing uh, the, the fixed route service if, if it be the desired of the board. Mm -hmm. So it is that type of project. There is no priority whatsoever on this. Mm -hmm. And my next question to you is, since we have yet to implement our <coughs> fixed bus route system, once we do, we then do a needs analysis. We can deviate from that if we see that that needs analysis tells us it's painting a totally different picture. Absolutely. There, there will be uh, an assessment. In fact, that the minute that we begin services, we'll begin the assessment of how effective are they, how, uh, how, how well did we get the route, <coughs> do they need to be adjusted. And mm -hmm. we will not um, necessarily uh, jump at every every time we identify uh, a potential need, but we will cumulatively be looking over a period of time to, to make an assessment. Uh, do we need stops at a different location? Is there, do we have demand from a different area of the county that is not being served? So, uh, absolutely. Two of my main concerns with uh, any project that we undertake <coughs> is always security and accessibility. Security for those who ride, security for those who provide the ride, accessibility for those who are challenged. And so that was taken into consideration. It is one of the items on, on the list. Mm -hmm. okay. All right, well, I yield. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Parkin. Commissioner Guider. Yes, Miguel, um, you were talking about the demand uh, ride, whatever. Um, demand response. That's where people, it's called dial ride. People can call up the day before and say, uh, I need the bus to pick me up and take me to my doctor's office. Mm -hmm. And that's what Carroll County implemented. And, and I was advocating that when I found out about what Carroll County is doing. It's very su successful over there because it's accessible to everybody in the county that needs transportation, not just a given area mm -hmm. of the county. And so, um, say, uh, after we kick off our fixed route and we find that, um, and then we implement the demand route, uh, demand ride route. I like to say dollar ride. <laughs> Sounds a little bit better. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> which allows for the bus to come to your house and pick you up. <laughs> you don't have to go down to a bus stop. And, everything. and say that becomes a lot more popular. It, it, is it some case um, if we find that, will we uh, tone down the fixed route and and build up more of the demand route? That is a 
a uh, decision uh, that the board will have to make because the demand response is much more costly than the fixed route because rather than circulating a particular uh, route or area, potentially someone anywhere within the county could make a request. And so the cost is much higher. So at some point, uh, and of course there is the expectation that, that uh, a number of centers that generate either because of jobs or because of uh, they generate uh, demand for bus service, uh, those would be located near or served by a fixed route. Uh, so this would be augmenting those services. You could uh, potentially, to, to your point, Commissioner, find that, uh, that there is a particular demand uh, for a specific uh, dial-a-ride, as you refer to it, demand response from an area, another area of the county, and then you'll be having to make the decision, is that best served by uh, targeting a route <coughs> to that area, or does that take precedence over the existing route? And so it's a decision for the future, uh, but the cost of uh, uh, dial a ride is much higher. But when you consider, and everybody has seen this, empty buses going round and round, <laughs> nobody riding them too. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're burning fuel that you don't need to burn, is what I'm saying. Sure. So, um, and you know, Cobb County had uh, problems with their bus system because people weren't riding the buses. It wasn't, you know, bringing in enough income, it's not supposed to break even. It's a service, I understand that. But uh, uh, I think in Carroll County they charge $3 for a, a trip, a one-way trip, and so that'd be $6. Much cheaper than taking a taxi or an Uber even. But, um, and just this year, in 2018, uh, our system here we had to reduce we we did away with two van pools because there weren't enough people riding it and then they raised the cost of all the others so um you know and the cost could be flexible but uh for the dial ride for the dial ride right now with the fixed bus system that we we're going to implement it doesn't serve the uh mirror lake area all the western side and the southern side of uh, the district. So it, it's not it's not going to help anybody in those areas. Right now we're a dollar like this. But I just wondered, would we reanalyze yes. the fixed route Absolutely. at some point if uh, it did not prove to be as uh, uh, popular as we, uh, some people? people think it's Sunday. So. Absolutely, uh, Commissioner. Um, when we engage in the study uh, update for the county, that is one of the things that we, we anticipate we will have a year or perhaps two years <coughs> of uh, experience with the fixed route. And that is one of the things that we will be taking a look at. What is the ridership for each particular mm -hmm. route? And, and where is the demand coming from? Because mm -hmm. uh, not only do we know that they got on the bus uh, somewhere within that route, we're going to be trying to ascertain uh, or glean from um, surveys where did they actually come from to get on the bus service. And, and so we would have a sense for where else could the route go. Mm -hmm. uh, where the in the western expanded. side of the county, there's more and more industry coming in. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, we've seen that here on Bright Star Road, Anderson Windows and people like that. But on <coughs> further out Highway 78, there's more and more uh, uh, south wire that's located in the bread place. All these new companies, and there's no, this route, this fixed route will not accommodate people working there so at all. So uh, it doesn't even pick up on Post Road, I don't believe, unless it's changed, I don't know. So um, uh, it's just not servicing the whole county where a fixed ride, uh, a dollar ride would. Understood, okay. and, and that we would be taking a look at where 
the demand is for additional <coughs> services. I yield back. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Mitchell. Yeah, yes, just, just one. Uh, I just want to piggyback on Commissioner Guider. And I think Vice Chair and I have had many conversations about the ridership, the demand, uh, and I think that body of work of committee will definitely <coughs> do their due diligence in assuring that what we're doing with the ridership or the routes, uh, if there's an, a need to make a change <coughs> add to, you know, whatever that is, I think, because it's about ridership. Mm -hmm. if, it, if it's going down Highway 5 and it doesn't, there's not a need, then why would we continue that route? Correct. I don't know. Okay, so with that though, the list that we got here. Um, I understand, I think the list, I've not had a chance to kind of review and look, look it all over. Great. My only concern is once we start kind of sharing this information with the public and, and others, it becomes that list of what we're doing, uh, our benchmark, and how do we assure with the general public, and although it may be a legal question or not, how do we assure with the legal public to make sure they understand this is not the official list because what I don't want to come back and say, you know, two years from now and somebody say in 2019, you know, February or March 4th, you guys had this list and this list became the list and they said, well, this is what you guys have published. Mm -hmm. And now here we are saying, no, that, that wasn't the official list. It was just something that we were using as a benchmark for ARC and everybody else. <coughs> I don't know how to do it. I don't. I mean, I, I don't, I'm not looking for an answer. I'm just only asking how do we do that without getting crossed up in the crossfire of this is the list and this is what you said. Because guess what? We don't want to say that it'll be ranked. It'll be brought to whoever commission is sitting at this time to their attention, and one of the commissioners who are for or against it will be the one to say yes, it was there, and now we'll have a problem. So my only concern is yes is a great list. Yes, it's a working process, I agree, and I think we should, but my concern is how we make sure that it's not official. It's an unofficial list. More than anything, do we kind of make sure we note it? Unofficial list, Flexible. blah, blah, blah. Flexible <laughs> list, blah, 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 and make it noted as such to assure that that's not, that's not a, what it become, because perception become, that's the list, <coughs> that's what you guys said, now you're changing it. If okay. I may, if I may try okay. to respond, yes. Commissioner. Um, the one way that it would become obvious that it is not the the list right. is that there is no money attached to it. There is no funding. There is no commitment on okay. the part of the county. Mm -hmm. Whenever you move forward to have an application for federal funds, there is a requirement that the <coughs> county act on and provide a supporting document that says we are committing to the 20% or whatever it is, mm -hmm. local share. That is where you have a direct commitment. This is, at this point, a planning level tool. Uh, in fact, uh, and, and I think I, I mentioned this initially, that normally the agency will conduct their own analysis first and, and not develop a list mm -hmm. using this methodology. In this particular case, they're, they're having to do that or they're wanting to do that because several of the counties have already done their analysis and they have a, a series of projects and mm -hmm. programs that they're going to have. Uh, they're going to be looking to implement in the future. So this is an aberration in the process, <coughs> I got you. Uh, but it's not requiring a, a commitment from the county at this point, and that is what makes it an unofficial. List. I got it, but, but Miguel, I, I must say, no matter how we try to, to doctor it up, if we if, if we use this list, it will become what people will possibly think it is the list, whether we have 20% or 5%. It will become the list. But I like the mere fact of calling it the planning level two list of something, you know, to kind of say it's unofficial <coughs> or something of that caliber. And I don't know the name for it, but you get, I'm, I'm just trying to avoid that situation that comes, yeah, that they come, not just the public, it'll be you guys here, it'll be us who will come up with that whole pr premise of this one was said on March 4th, 2019. We can, we can tag it as the unofficial list when we submit it to the ATL. Got it. And, 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 and this list should be always noted as such or something that a category that you guys can, can kind of call it. I don't, I don't officially know what the name is, but it needs to be something to that, to that sort because if not, I promise you, 
you know, a year from now, we forgot. <laughs> you know, six months from now, we forgot. that This is not the, the list. We, this is the planning, this is the, the, the planning level tool. <laughs> but no, they'll have this list swinging around saying, this was the list that you guys did on, on March 4th. And, and here we are trying to justifiably say, no, that would no, this is what was said, go back and look at the tapes, blah, 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 blah. But no answer needed, though. No, you know, not a question. I yield yeah. back. Okay. <laughs> no, Thank you so much, um, Director Valentin. I believe you will wrap it up. And I, I will close with this, uh, Commissioner Guide. I do have a comment regarding the bus buses and the sizes of the buses. I uh, met with uh, Mike Boyce, who's the chairman of uh, Cobb County, and he was praising Douglas County and his entire uh, county because of our ability to be prudent and look at our, and, and also strategic, and go with smaller buses, and, or should I say, I call them cutaways. <laughs> 15, they have vans, 15 seats versus 55, and, he, and they, they actually, they're investing in some smaller uh, cutaways. That's what he's gonna do. He said during the daytime, those buses will be moving those 15 passengers, should I say, after peak periods. So he said, uh, they commend Douglas County for what we're doing. And I so. noticed in Jacksonville, Florida, they, they have reduced the size of yeah, the so it's just the size. So I think we're, 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 we're pretty strategic, and I believe that I'm just going to think optimistically and, and pray that we have at least, if it's just 10 people on the bus, or the kind of way it, it, it will serve the purpose and the needs of the citizens of Douglas County. All right, we'll move on to the next item. We'll coroner 2018 update. I believe we have Mr. Bussey here today. Uh, the coroner called me in advance. Now, for the record, she is uh, under the weather, and also she has some family uh, issues came up, and she couldn't make it today. And so thank you so much, Mr. Bussey, for being here. Do you have a PowerPoint presentation or anything? No, ma'am. She wanted me to advise you all that she want to do that in the next meeting. Okay. okay. She, um, but first of all, good morning, Madam Chair. Good morning. And other uh, commissioners and all department heads. Uh, what the court wanted me to advise you all with that 2018 update, she wanted to give you a breakdown what the office had been doing from the time she, from 2018 January up to the present date. And doing that, she was going to break it down by the number of bodies, I'm sorry, by the number of deaths that had occurred during uh, the year 2018 from January up to the present time of 2019. By category, by age, race, and also what the deaths were, i.e. homicide, suicide, overdoses. So she wanted to do it at the next meeting. But I would like to um, address two things that happened um, in, our, in the previous meeting back in February 18th, when um, a concerned citizen um, made a statement that uh, a part-time employee, which was me, was riding a camel in Egypt by the name of Clyde. <coughs> yes, I did. I went to Egypt, but I paid for it myself out of my own expenses. As a department head, as a manager myself in other fields I've been in, uh, part-time employees don't get vacation. They pay for their own trips, unless they are full-time, and then they get a certain type of vacation time frame. But they're only for full-time, get a part to get a vacation. And um, Pierce, you acknowledged that I was being paid by talk, the county. Talk to me. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Okay, I stand correct. I stand correct. Okay. Forgive me. And that um, I was being paid by the county for that trip. It didn't happen. Paid on my expenses, myself, my credit card, which I would like to, if necessary, I can bring those documents to the board and show them to the board that I paid for it myself. Uh, secondly, <clears throat> excuse me, last year, during a meeting when Channel 46 was here at Bulldog, I was one of the um, board members said that I had a cloud over my head. Well, I want to make it transparent that I don't have a cloud on my head. Something happened 13 years ago that I was exonerated for. During that time frame, I was exonerated. I have been a president of a college, academic dean, also served on many boards in my own county. And I received a House resolution from the General Assembly in 2012 when I had 40 years of law enforcement and education. So I don't know what that cloud is, but that cloud has not hampered me from doing what I need to do for any governmental agency or private industry or whatever. But I would like to say this. I enjoy what I do for this county. I enjoy working for the coroner's office. I enjoy serving the people of this county because it's a passion that I have since I've been in law enforcement and education. I like doing what I do. It's not about the pay, because I'm not being paid that much as a part-time employee. It was said I make 30 hours a week, but I work over 30 hours a week. But I like what I do, and I'm gonna continue to do it until I'm dismissed by the coroner. 
I just want to make it perfectly clear that there's nothing that we are doing that's out of order. Everything we're doing is transparent. And I said in the last meeting of last year, come over to the coroner's office and see what we're doing. That way you have a full understanding of what the coroner's office job is. Because if I went around the room, probably you couldn't give me the defined job description of the coroner. So I just want to say thank you for this opportunity that I have to work with this county in the coroner's office. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? No questions. I just have have a comment. Yes, yeah, I do remember you uh, being a dean, and I was an adjunct professor at one of the colleges in Atlanta, and you were my dean. So thank you for your service, and I appreciate what you did. And thank you again uh, what you and the coroner's office are doing this time. Okay. And another note too, I am a minister. Oh, okay, minister. So yeah. I would not do anything that's out of order because I believe in one thing that God says: no weapons formed shall prosper. So if you want to throw a rock in my house, check your house first. Okay. Um, Mr. Buzzay, I have one, one, um, Commissioner Guyton has a question. Yes. For okay, Commissioner Guyton. I think the statement that uh, you quoted that was said in February of this year was that the county paid for your vacation. That's not what was stated. It said they paid you for 30 hours of work while you were on vacation. Well, I heard that you know, apparently. And, the, and I've seen some documents that actually back that up. Uh, you, uh, the coroner turned you in as having worked so many hours that the week that you were on vacation. That's what, it, that's what was stated. And uh, you referred to a statement that I said about a cloud being over your head, okay? Since you said it, I'm going to clarify what I was talking about. Uh, you can Google Larry Bussey and you will see where there was an arrest warrant for impersonating an officer, okay? You pleaded no, no uh, first offender and you paid a fine. So that's what I was talking about. And that can be Googled and that can be checked with the DA's office in that county. So. Uh, I did not, uh, I was not specific. I just said that you were driving a county car back and forth to, to a home which had not been reported to finance. So you were not being taxed on that benefit. So, uh, but I just wanted to clarify what you just brought up, okay? May I uh, clarify what you just brought just, up? You know, we don't want to go back and forth. If I may, ma'am, just one second. Uh, Mr. Buster, what we want to do, can we, we'll talk to take this one offline because okay. this is going right. to be okay. personal. And I wanted it, I really wanted a presentation right. from the court and I wanted an update today regarding what's going on. This mm -hmm. is not a time to bicker, but what we'll do, I'll set an appointment so uh, myself and, and Commissioner Guyton, you can meet so you can continue to speak if, if that's what I want to do today, okay? Because this, we're getting out of order. I just want to come in, I'm still post-certified. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you. All right. Appreciate your presentation and tell the court. We look forward to her update. All right. Thank in you. In two weeks. Thank you. Now, guys, let's move on. We're going to, we have approval of the minutes tomorrow. Board of Commissioners, take a look at those and be prepared to proceed accordingly. We have a proclamation tomorrow proclaiming the months of uh, March as Arts, Culture, and Humanities Month in Douglas County. And that will be rendered by Ms. Patty Puckett. And then next, we'll move on to our business items. We have tab number five, authorization to renew the agreement with Republic Services for Transportation and Disposal Municipal Solid Waste, and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. Director Jenkins, I believe I saw you earlier. There you go. Go to the podium. Good morning, Madam Chair. Good morning. Good morning. Commissioners, uh, Gary Jenkins, Government Services. I have two items today from the Solid Waste Management Department. Number one is the authorization to renew an agreement with Republic Services for the transportation and disposal of municipal solid waste. Uh, let it be noted that this is money in, money out, but we collect it to scale. It goes into the Enterprise Fund, and then we pay this uh, amount to Republic. Uh, we do this every year. They've been with us a long time. They're asking this year for a 3.29% increase from 27.49 a ton to 28.45 per ton based on current tonnage 
and the volume that we're receiving right now that will result in two, a $12,480 annual increase. This begins in May. The reason we're here so early, there's a 90-day auto renew clause, so we catch it early where both parties know what's going on. Do they still like us? Do we still like them? The answer apparently is yes. So we are recommending this to be approved if you see fit. Okay, any questions from the Board of Commissioners? What, what was that increase again? What, what was the, you said the increase? It would be a 3% increase, but total value, dollar value. 3.49%. Uh -huh. And right now our volume is at 13,000 tons annually. Okay. okay. Mr. Just, Carlton, I believe you have a question. So this will impact our budget? Enterprise fund budget. Mm -hmm. And we can absorb this. The the budget for the landfill fund is set, and they run their own. Um, I think you would be able to absorb it within your current budget from moving within line items. Is that correct? That is correct. Yes, mm -hmm. we do that. We did anticipate mm -hmm. this increase. Okay, it's very modest to be honest with you. Okay. <laughs> I think you're right. <coughs> Thank you. I yield back. Okay. Commission Mitchell. Thanks for that question. Yes, what, what was the dollar amount? Twelve thousand, blah blah blah. The, the total what we're estimating to be the right. total yeah. increase, twelve thousand four hundred and eighty dollars. It's ninety six cents a ton. Right is how it works out. Okay. Okay. And and yes, this is an enterprise fund and, and, and all of that is kind of captured within and it is with this particular budget or bucket of money that we'll, we'll call it uh, you can and you are able to absorb that amount yes um, and and do you think that's a moderate generous or decent increase or I do um, I do okay we've been with them since 2005 and we shop around every year okay we talked to all the major waste companies to see if they got an interest in quoting on this mm -hmm. and when we give them the money amount of 2845, mm -hmm. they take off running. Got it. Got no it. interest. Got it. Mm -hmm. So we, we've got a good rate even with the increase. Yes. Got it. Okay. All right. I yield. Okay. Now move on to tab number six. Tab number six authorization to approve a task order of 2019 uh, 1 with Atlantic Coast Consulting in the amount of $37,850 for assistance <coughs> with preparing a five year solid uh, waste. Permit update as mandated by Georgia EPD and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. Director Jenkins again. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, we did not specifically budget this amount of money because we didn't know it was coming our way. We came out of the legislature in the last of December, I mean, the last of November, 1st of December. So we start our budget process in August now, I think. And, uh, so we, but what we do is in our professional services account. If we build in some contingency money where something goes wrong, EPD orders us to do something that's not debatable, then we got the money. Uh, I think year before last we had to put in two brand new water wells that we did not budget for. Mm -hmm. So we just reached down in there and sometimes we have to delete some projects maybe that we did anticipate that wasn't mandated and just keep on keeping on. Hopefully <coughs> the money will be there. The money's going to be there one way or the other. Mm -hmm. We can take it from uh, payroll from <coughs> unfunded positions, maybe. We can do it, um, maybe cut back and instead of more than three or four times a year, more two times a year. Mm -hmm. I think we're going to be okay. we got to be okay. Not debatable. Any questions on the Board of Commissioners? Commissioner Robinson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, duly noted, uh, I know the landfill tends to be unique um, in, in enterprise fund, etc. Um, I appreciate the fact, you know, I'm a big proponent of studies, whether it's whatever. Uh, I think that's important for us, for us as a board of commissioners to make uh, important decisions. Uh, we, we need a little bit deeper dive sometime on a certain matter. Uh, on this one, um, I get it, $37,000, but I'm, so again, we're, we're, we're here to oversee and observe. We're, we're not administrative um, <coughs> as district commissioners. So, so what you're saying is that as a director, you've got some discretion on how you manage your budget. Mm -hmm. In other words, you can move some things around you. 
I mean, the county administrator, I'm trusting you guys that you, you got this, that there will be no failure in the delivery of what had been planned that we signed off on, but yet there's enough room for y'all to make y'all a decision. Am I hearing that right? Yes, sir. Okay. Any questions? Thank you. Okay. Any other questions from the board? Commissioner Yes, Gary. Um, <clears throat> you have the money to absorb this $37,000 in your enterprise fund. We do. You do. Um, now, this is for a five-year <clears throat> plan, and we've talked about we don't know what we're going to do with the landfill. Can you not shorten it to a two-year plan or something like that to allow for uh, us to, this board, to make the decision on how, what we're going to do with the landfill going forward? Unfortunately, we don't have very much input as to what EPD tells EPD us we have to do. EPD told you you had to do a five-year plan. This is a brand new program that's never been done before relates to every waste handling facility in the state of Georgia. Everybody has to do it. Now, are some less expensive to have this study done? Now, the bottom line is it's a 120-day project. It has to be signed off on by engineers, geologists, stamped, send back in the EPD, let them evaluate it. They send it back to you. Now, if they send it back, say, we want you to do this in addition to, hopefully, we can get that done for the same amount. And hopefully, there's nothing in it. What it is, the uh, the permit was issued in 1987. It's not been modified or changed in all that time, which is 30 some odd years. So it becomes a little bit more complex. If they're doing it on something that handles MSW, which is your household waste, of, of course the study's going to cost more. Also, Dalton Whitfield. They're up around $65,000 on their cost to do this. It's very complex. In my opinion, they should have given us at least one more year yeah. to budget for it. But it's just something that comes out, and regulators are regulators. Yeah, might be a bad. Okay. Well, thank you. Commissioner, you look like you want to say something. I, I do, but I think, I think he. Okay, I guess I'll say something. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> so, as uh, Vice Chair stated, so you'll absorb it somewhere in your budget, not that you have it in your budget. You're going to make do based on making some adjustments. To we do. We, I can't tell you exactly what exactly. we put in there. Exactly. The contingency. <laughs> right. Looks like it wasn't forty thousand dollars. Got it. Got it. And 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 this is not something. This is something we have to do based on Georgia E. PD and, and as they make the request. That's great. Um, whether it's a two year, five year, but they set a five year plan, even though I know we're, we're having other discussions about what we might be in or out of the landfill business. True. We still are working, in, that still is ongoing. Yes, sir. We got a couple of uh, proposals in purchasing right now as we speak. Two. Right. Got it. Got it. Now, what are the likelihood of them coming back, Georgia EPD, come back saying, okay, what you sent us was good, however, we need X? more information about you know how many cans are out there you know versus you know dirt that would probably give us a little bit of an opportunity to negotiate with them okay because the effective and this is not this whole study now right but as you know we, we have about eight and a half years left in the c and d landfill right however we still got the transfer station right we still right. got the recycle mm -hmm. area mm -hmm. and both of those generate revenue mm -hmm. and uh so it all comes down to it. We used to, Jennifer will know this, we used to budget for four different departments mm -hmm. within the solid waste department. Right. And we said, this don't make sense. Let's mm -hmm. just, one, let's consolidate it. And that's what we've done. So we can move money around. Unfortunately, the recycle business is on a terrible downswing, with paper and plastic. Chance that we may have to quit doing that or charge for it. Right. Uh, and you just go through it and you, you know, we've raised our rates last year right <clears throat> I don't think we can go back again right now no no, no. and uh but we'll we'll get there yeah okay okay all right um get her done I guess but thank you thank you all right I'll go back okay thank you well thank you so much yes ma'am thank you uh, director Jenkins we'll move on to tab number seven authorization to advertise for a public hearing to consider amending chapter five of the Douglas County Code of Ordinances related to animal control. Director McMillan, good morning. Good morning. I'm here to ask to uh, authorize um, 
advertise for a public hearing to consider amending Chapter 5 of the Douglas County Ordinances, which deal with uh, the animal control ordinances in Douglas County, specifically adding a uh, community cat ordinance in order to address our feral <coughs> cat problem in Douglas County. Uh, feral cats, as um, some of you may know, are cats that are already here in the community, but they're running at large, uh, unvaccinated, unspayed, and neutered. They populate and they create a problem. The community cat program would define the feral cats as community cats, allowing them to be spayed and neutered so they would not reproduce. And this, over time, allows us to control the population of the feral cats. Um, it would also allow us to track them and have uh, policies and procedures uh, that the animal control department could control in order to control these communities and allow them uh, to live out their lives and control the population. They're already here. We just need to get something in place. The community cat wording in our ordinance also gives us the ability to apply for grants uh, with organizations that are specifically geared to help feral cats. Okay. Any questions from the board of commissioners? Commissioner Guy. Yes. Um, yes, ma'am. Um, I've always been told that if uh, there's a stray cat in your community and you feed it, it's your cat. <laughs> and, and so is that true? That is not true. Because <laughs> um, you keep saying community cat community or whatever. <laughs> and uh, I've been told that the uh, animal uh, control tells them that, that uh, if you start feeding it because you feel sorry for this uh, stray cat, that it becomes your cat. In the past, that was what was said by the animal control department when I came on board. I didn't see an ordinance that backed that up. And who won't feed a hungry stray animal? Um, a lot of people call us into it call them in and we go and pick them up but we're specifically talking about feral cats not tame cats that, that need to be picked up and helped but what we find in a lot of communities is there will be several cats that several families feed and nobody wants to own these cats because they didn't bring them there they didn't ask for them but they feed them and they don't mind them staying there and instead of picking them up and we try to find barn programs for them, but there just aren't enough places for them to go. Um, so instead of picking up, up and euthanizing them, we can spay and neuter them with grant money and allow them to live out their lives and help control vermin in the neighborhoods for those that choose to have the cats there. Well, uh, I thought that's what you were already doing. Uh, well, that if you caught a feral cat, you spayed and neutered them, and then shots, I guess, and, and release them again. We Is have been doing that on a limited basis uh, for persons that have barns or property that they want to allow. Um, their cats are considered in the right. ordinance to be leashed. The community cat ordinance would s release those cats from having to go by the leash law and allow them to free run, which they're already there and allow us to apply for grants in order to spay and neuter more of the cats and, and do this on in accordance with the ordinance. So the funding for all of this would be through a grant, is that what you're saying? We would apply for grants. It would be grants and donations. Right now we cannot because we do not have this ordinance. We do apply for grants, but I feel that, and I'm being told by Best Friends Society who are willing to make a presentation at our hearing, that if we have this specific wording and we have the protection in order to protect the community cats that we would be open to more grants and more organizations that would consider donating to us because we have the protection in place. Um, Paulden County has uh, went through this program and they're successful with it. Um, that's just recently Cobb County. Um, Lifeline does it in Fulton and DeKalb. And Hall County just made the news for accepting the program, and they just got a grant for twenty-five thousand dollars. It also keeps animals. It also keeps the cats out of our shelter, gets them back to where they can live out their lives, and prevents us from having to euthanize over two hundred cats a year. And one last question: If uh, an individual can capture a feral cat and they 
put it in a cage? Can they bring it to you? Or are they going to be up? I've, I've also heard people say they get to the uh, animal uh, shelter and they're told, well, we can't do this because this is your cat. You brought it to us. <laughs> and a feral cat would be caught in a trap that we would, we already rent them out. Can an individual cat? Yes. Capture one and bring it to you. Yes, that's, that's yes. And they can use our traps or theirs or carriers, wherever they want, as long as the cat's feral and they're willing to have it returned to their property, spayed, neutered, and with the ear tip and a market chip for tracking, uh, they can definitely bring it and then pick it up after the surgery. All right, I yield back. Thank you. Commissioner, yes. uh, not Commissioner Mitchell. Sorry. How would you know, though, if he or she brought a cat in that if it was a community cat or not. I mean, how, they'll just tell you that and you guys were like, okay, sure, we'll do all that, you know. The cats that are brought in under the community cat program are generally feral, so we can't pick them up. <laughs> They're not socialized. <coughs> so that's the cats we're targeting is, is the unsocialized cats, because those are the cats that are in the community that are not considered own. So once they bring in an unsocialized feral cat and a trapper carrier, um, we're going to ear tip it that make, and microchip it, and that makes it a community cat from that time on. And then, but as to how the, the, the how the cat reacts or responds determines he or she is a is community it, is cat. I'm just I'm acceptable not. for the program. If I mean, we pick up cats, and most cats we pick up, you know, that are not fair. We can just handle them. We just pick them up. Got they're it. they're sweet Got little it. kitty cat. Feral cats, they they have their ears back and they have the football head and their eyes are dilated and yeah. they're quite angry. Yeah. <laughs> so it's very easy to determine big eyed kitty and football okay. head kitty and well, thanks for the heads up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, it's very apparent. Okay. Thank you. Um, so but currently, um, on a case-by-case -case basis, you guys will take some and do some and just fade and do with these guys or whatever the case may be. But you're applying for the grant to do more or just applying for the grant to do any? To more. We want to get to our, it's last year we <coughs> missed no-kill status by 2%. Got it. Um, which is 90% safe mm -hmm. rate mm -hmm. and gets you to no-kill status, mm -hmm. which is where I would like to be at 95%. Mm -hmm. And I feel like we can meet this goal. Good. And this is Good. one of the tools that we can use to do that. Yeah, and, and I'm glad that you're reaching, doing mm -hmm. that because I, I, I'm a cat, fish, doll, lover, you know, so I, and, and <laughs> any kind of way we can kind of save these guys, you yeah. know. And yeah. we have 71 cats in the shelter. If anybody needs a cat, yeah. please see me. <laughs> How are you guys doing in the fish department, though? No, we, we only have two fish. We have two fish. Okay. Um, I have two if you need two. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, so, so with that, you actually release them back to the general area where you find them or mm -hmm. capture them, and, and they'll go back to, to doing their thing and hope that they won't populate, basically. They, well, they won't. Well, they, they won't after yeah. you. Yes, yes. <laughs> after you step them in, you know, because then you're like, okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you. All right, I, I yield back. Thank you, Commissioner. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, well, we look forward to this public hearing, um, Director. Um, and I think it's going to, we'll see how it goes. Okay. All right, thank, thank you. you. We'll move on to work. tab number okay. eight. Mm -hmm. Authorization to purchase two replacement park security vehicles using 2016 SWAS <laughs> equipment bonds at a total cost of 53000 $328 as recommended by the Parks and Recreation Oversight Committee. Director Dukes? Yes, ma'am. We, uh, we're we requesting, as you said, to purchase two park security vehicles. Mm -hmm. uh, both these vehicles are over 10 years old and have over 200,000 miles on. So uh, that comes as a recommendation from the Oversight Committee, and it will be, uh, they will be purchased with SPLOT. Okay, any questions? Commissioner Dyer. Uh, Gary, are they going to be elected? <laughs> no. We ain't got there yet. We ain't got there yet. <laughs> we ain't got there yet. Uh, I thought we were yeah. moving toward that direction. We were well, uh, I mean, we can uh, research the cost on an electric vehicle if, if uh, that's... Well, based on the information that we received from Fleet, the Fleet did, did, some, uh, did their homework. Um, as far as right now, we'd be better off if we started going hybrid versus going straight electric. It's not 
that cost effective. Are these going to be high? <coughs> I couldn't these answer that high. question. They were. They came as a recommendation from Fleet, both these vehicles. Right. So I'm not sure if they're hybrid or not. I don't think so. I don't. I don't think it was. What What kind of vehicle can we? Name the vehicle? Sure. Uh, one of them is a Ford F-150, and the other is a Durango, um, Dodge Durango. Mm -hmm. So Fleet works on these type cars. And yes, ma'am. They recommended both of them. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much, Director. Yes, ma'am. Um, We'll move on to tab number nine, authorization to approve a contract with Atlanta West Pentecostal Church for use of, the, of its facilities for a polling place for precinct uh, number 1270 and authorize the chairman to sign all the latest <coughs> documents. Director Kidd, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Madam Chair, Commissioners, and to you, the general public. The, the line item in question is a, a move of a, a polling location. Currently, that polling location is located at Colonial Hills Christian Academy. Uh, Colonial Hills allowed us and um, were gracious enough to allow us to continue in 2018 election cycle to use their facility, even though the school had actually closed. They're in the process of trying to sell their facility, so we have to move mm -hmm. <laughs> these voters to a new location. I've currently been in talks with Atlanta West Pentecostal Church, which is located around the corner from the current uh, facility. So from a voter perspective, this is still a convenient uh, location that meets our guidelines of having all polling locations located within a two mile radius of the home address if possible. Uh, this, would, this agreement uh, has no monetary value uh, with it, by that I mean they're not paying us anything, we wouldn't pay them anything, but they have agreed to let us use their facility for elections. Okay. Any questions from the board commission or comments? Commissioner Guy? Well. <laughs> uh, if you, for the public, just tell them uh, what precinct this is. Okay, uh, the, the precinct, the, the name uh, changes based off of what you actually call it. This is our 1270 uh, precinct. Atlanta West exact address, uh, let me get that, I'm sorry for not having Vicinity. it. Vicinity. Uh, it's, off, it's off of Skyline. Uh, Skyview. Sky 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 I'm sorry about that. It's off of Skyview. Uh, anybody else? District Two. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, just for the public. Skyview and Mount Vernon. Yes. Okay. <coughs> All right, I give that. And it's located on the corner, so there are no like other <laughs> landmark features that would draw you to this area other than the church itself. But it's a large facility that you can't miss it. Okay. But All I can right. give that address if anyone wants it. Just wanted to I saw Commissioner Mitchell first. So, so um, how are you planning to notify those voters? Okay. Any, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Any changes to a precinct location, we're bound by a specific election law. It can't be done within a specific time frame, but we're far enough out right now, which is why we're working on this now, to not hit any election deadlines. But for all uh, voters affected that will receive a new precinct card with uh, that change, we'll run uh, advertisements in the paper uh, with that change. We'll post it on the county's website. We'll also, uh, this change will take effect this election year, but going into next uh, year too, since this will be a new change in a larger election year. We're also going to be sending letters to households affected by this change and uh, everyone in the county going into next year will receive a list of polling locations yeah. that are affected uh, for the Even with this change. So Even with this change. Got it. Got it. Got it. Okay. Yes. Okay. And there'll be signage at the old location and the new location for this election year and going into next election year will still have signed it at the old location and the uh, new location yeah. for a specific number of elections next year as well. It will be something stated there, posted there rather, not stated, posted there that states this is the new polling precinct. Yes. Which is right around the corner. Yes. Uh, 
Yeah, and, and, and this is where you kind of go and go, okay, good. Well, well, good. Okay. I yield back. Thank you, Commissioner Mitchell. Vice Chairman Robinson. Yeah, Commissioner Mitchell answered my exact question. I feel good, so I'm fine. Thank you. Thank you. Can you ask mine too? All right, so I got her back. See if you can read your mind. No, he didn't. He didn't. He did. Um, Mr. Kidd, my question to you is the polling facilities. Some seem to have different restrictions or different rules that they like to go by. Can you tell me if signage and, and those types of things and parking and all of that has been addressed with this polling location? Signage and parking uh, have been addressed with this location. Not, not just, uh, we're bound by a myriad of different rules that are affected with signage and with locations. Uh, those include whether or not it's a private location or if it's uh, a facility that we're renting from, like a church or something like that. But we are also under what are called ADA compliance rules, mm -hmm. and this location does fall within all of those pre-established rules. If there is a specific signage issue that uh, you have that you want to address toward a specific polling location, I'm happy to do that too, not just in this meeting at any point. Okay. All right. Any other questions from the board? Thank you so much, Director Kidd. We appreciate this wonderful <coughs> presentation and update. Uh, tab number 10. 10. Authorization to create a new juvenile program. Well, a new juvenile program position for juvenile justice incentive grant project manager to be funded by juvenile justice incentive grant, uh, criminal justice coordinating uh, council grant. Uh, Jenny McDavid. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's actually Jennifer King. Jennifer King. Thank you, Jennifer, You're for welcome. being here this morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So, Jennifer, you'll be taking all these. Uh, I will. Okay. Yes, I'll, so, I'll, yeah. um, this is for a new position um, within the office. It's going to be 100% grant funded. We got the approval from our grant source that's already been a, um, funding this program where we serve at risk youth. Um, through various curriculum evidence-based practices. So this would just be the position for that person to continue that work. Okay. Any questions from the board? Commissioner Geiger. Uh, yes, ma'am. Um, the juvenile courts come up here probably more than anybody about grants. Do y'all go out there and find these grants yourselves? Or, um, I think we, some of the other departments can take some <laughs> lessons from y'all because y'all do a great job on we, we do, and some of these, this one we've actually had since 2013, uh, but we are constantly searching for ways to fund programming for our children and families that we serve because we don't have enough resources. Yes. Do you do that? There's Jenny McDade? Or? It, it's kind of a group effort. Um, Jenny has written grants forever. As as I know it. Um, I, I mean, almost every meeting y'all would yes. come in before us. Uh, about a grant, so uh, y'all do a fantastic job. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, we're we're trying to train and let other people start taking over, um, writing the grants and managing the grants. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. so kudos to you because you do a great job. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're very good job. Thank you. You're next. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, Jennifer. We'll move to the next item. <laughs> we have number 11, authorization to approve a contract from Christine Callahan for the project manager for the uh, Juvenile Justice Incentive Grant Programs and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. Ms. King, Jan? Yes, ma'am. This is um, for that position. Christine has been running our programs as a vendor, so we are asking that she um, receive a contract to continue that with this new grant funding. Okay, with the grant funding, you answered my question. Any questions from the Board of Commissioners? Okay, we'll, we'll move on to the next item. Okay, uh, tab number 12, authorization to apply for State of Georgia Accountability Court Funding Program uh, fiscal year 20 with the Council of Accountability Court Judges, CACJ, the Criminal Justice Coordinating Council, in the amount of $91,285. Uh, Ms. King again. Yes, this is our um, annual grant we apply for for our family drug court. Mm -hmm. um, and it is due, I believe, later this month. That's to fund treatment, um, drug screening, different supplies, um, evaluations, all those things to serve our clients. Okay. Any questions with the Board of Commissioners? Thank you all so much. Job well done. Mm -hmm. 
responded. Thank you. Do a great job. And so. just so you know, I think federal funds have been released for our eight hundred forty thousand dollar grant. The one so that yes, that that was a nice we, <coughs> that has been held up, and so we will probably be back in front of you because we'll have to hire um, a couple of people with those grant funds um, in the future and get started with. Expanding, mm -hmm. okay. and that's the largest grant that you've ever received. Mm -hmm. that's, 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 that's a big one, <laughs> big fish. Thank you all yes. so much. All right, next we have tab number 13 authorization for the juvenile public defender's office to hire legal support staff for two attorneys. Uh, hello, attorney Gordon, this morning. Good morning, Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. So we are here this morning on um, behalf of the Juvenile Public Defender's Office. That's myself and my assistant, Ashley Rogers, who is also here with us this morning. Uh, we are asking the board for authorization for legal support staff um, in our office. We do need help with our administrative duties. Um, currently, we are taking on uh, everything. We don't mind, but we need a little help so that we can um, give our clients more attention. Um, so we would need someone in our office to assist us with the, the case management filing, copying, uh, mail services, et cetera, um, what you would expect a legal support staff member to do. Um, the salary for that position would be $30,995.74. That is $14.90 an hour, and then full benefits also would be included. Okay. Thank you. Any questions from the Board of Commissioners? Comments, Commissioner Geiger. Yes, ma'am. Um, what was your name again? Valerie Gordon. Valerie, I'm yes, sorry. Uh, now, is this a budgeted thing? Uh, was this in your budget? Or was it a BIR? I don't know if you want me to respond to that, but it you is. Can. Um, you can. You can think. Yeah, yeah, board. Get board. on the camera. Yes. Yeah. 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 We up want you to get on the camera Sorry. this morning. <laughs> Sorry. Um, it is one of our uh, revisited uh, BIRs. It was BIR number three for um, from our budget from this past year okay so the uh, the funds uh, do you have them in, you don't have them in your budget no you're no. asking the county commissioners to uh, transfer some funds into your budget correct but it was on one year BRR correct which is a budget improvement request mm -hmm. for the public's benefit mm -hmm. okay uh, so um, okay I just wanted to clarify that okay. thank you can, can Lisa please add an in the budget mm -hmm. and we just transfer the money from contingency? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yes. We, that's it. Any other questions from the board? Thank you so much. Thank you. Attorney Gordon. And thank you, Judge. Thank you. It was a perfect time to be here to support us and help the uh, board of issues understand. All right, next tab, number 14, authorization to accept the grant from National Association of Boca Assistant Administration in the amount of $5,305 and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents and, and amend the budget if necessary. Megan Knight. Hey, Megan, how are you today? Good morning. Good morning. Um, I'm Megan Knight from the District Attorney's Office. I'm the Director of Victim Services there. Um, we were informed of the grant release for this particular grant for National Crime Victims' Rights Week on October 25th of 2018, and the application was submitted on November 2nd of 2018, which was the deadline. Um, the original, <clears throat> the parameters for the award were up to $6,000, and we applied for the set amount and received that amount. The original award date was expected to be at the end of December, but it ended up being actual award date of February 7th. Um, so this is why we're here um, as quickly as we can to get this approved because this money doesn't require a match but everything will have to go through the county um, and it will be submitted on a reimbursement <coughs> after the event is um, after the week takes place in April so okay any questions from the Board of Commissioners pretty self-explanatory thank you so much thank you. Megan appreciate you coming in Tab number 10, I mean, tab number 15. This is last but not least. I don't want to say 10. I, that's why I need my glasses on at all times. Tab number 15, authorization to approve a grant, a, a contract with Angel Brooke Contreras for the assistant public defender, defender in state court, Monica Miles. Hello, Attorney Miles. How are you doing today? Thank you. Thank you. This is. Uh, I seem to come up here a lot with this. It's the same position that we keep uh, having to refill 
It says no impact on the budget. Uh, one of our current public defenders uh, resigned, took a position elsewhere. So we're having to fill that position with um, Angel Contreras. So it's, if there's any questions about that. Any questions for the board, from the board of commissioners? Uh, yes, Vice Chairman Robinson. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I was familiar with this position per se. Uh, I, again, in a broader conversation, again, policy <coughs> compensation, what was the reason for leaving? Was it just good old factory money, or you don't mind sharing? This is policy conversation. I understand <coughs> she was offered a position in another public interest field uh, in Atlanta working for the Attorney General's office, and yes, she's getting an increase in salary. Um, Okay. I just was curious if this was the wrong I mean, she enjoyed working here, and, and right. we wish she was still here. I mean, there was she liked the job, but it was just a better opportunity. Yeah, and, and, and again, we always talk about this compensation conversation. And again, we're uh, a moderate-sized county. Uh, we're not in a high urban area um, where uh, this price differential going across the river is a premium. And to be competitive, we, we've got this. We, we mm -hmm. people. You know, and again, it's competitive. You go pick people off no more than those guys who follow sports. Go pick people off. I mean, it, 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 it's part of the nature of it. So while I'm, uh, I hate to lose somebody and I'm okay with supporting you with your ask for, I just, it, it, it's going to always be this way. It, it, you'll, as soon as you catch up, somebody else is putting pressure on the market. And, and so uh, I'm just curious. I just, I'm good. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for our public defender? All right. Thank you so All much. Right. Thank you. Um, Miles. Uh, Board of Commissioners, do you have any other questions or comments before I uh, call for an executive session? Uh, tab number 16 for the, for the record is a board appointment for Housing Authority, and that is to be discussed in executive session. Okay, Commissioner Dido. Yes, ma'am. It came to my attention this weekend that there's been a bill introduced, uh, and it, I think it passed the House, about um, it's going to circumvent our codes about our uh, square footage uh, requirements here in Douglas County and even the facades and everything. Is it uh, House Bill 473 or something like that? Uh, has anybody been monitoring this and does anybody realize what it will do to our overlays and our, and our codes and everything? Our external affairs director has been monitoring it very closely and could uh, vice chairman Robin that yes and I know you want to add to it. Well I did I don't understand why uh, our delegation would uh, vote to pay I think it's been passed to the Senate, has it not? I'm not sure about that, but our delegation was notified. Yeah they've been notified. They've been notified and they were on the same page with us. Mm -hmm. Okay. So yeah. uh, we're gonna hopefully get this uh, yes, stop hopefully. before it goes yeah. any Further. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, all of them we uh, were I, down with the Someone Capitol. called and told me about it, and I said, do what? <laughs> yeah, we were at the Capitol, Capitol uh, I believe, Thursday, uh -huh. Senate Vice Chairman. We had a meeting, the ACC meeting, and also our external affairs director was right at the helm, just making sure that she was, uh, again, talking to our legislators. And then I know she uh, spoke to her boss, which but is why I tell you. And she sent an email out, too, yeah. saying, vote no. Yeah. So. All right. Thank you. Did you have any comments? That's like, a relief. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, again, the reason we go to the ACCG, we, you know, the governor, new governor was there, lieutenant governor was there, and the House Speaker. They gave comments, but we also, it was a joint meeting between ACG, ACCG and GMA, which is kind of, it was pretty neat um, for all of us to be together last week. But we, we walked over to the Capitol, and uh, we had a chance to get up on the floor. And, you know, you just grab your legislators as they come by. But, but to that point, when we heard that, this would be terrible to, yes. to Madam Guy's point. I mean, you're talking about um, basically it's the uh, home builders and the realtors basically are trying to change the way standards are done. <coughs> In other words, they believe that we put too much restrictions on their product types. I'm like, man, there's no way you let private sector. <coughs> it would be terrible. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I just absolutely the wrong thing to do. Uh, they just want to be able to come in here, cookie cutter, get in and get out. Realtors just want to sell products and stuff, and they believe that we slow things down. We put these standards in place, we're restricting. I think that gets into homeowner covenants. I mean, it, it opens up the door, and I just, but that right there, we should be allowed to sort of govern how things come and do. It, it can't just be a market driven where they come, because again, nothing wrong with home building, but not without restrictions. Right. 
not without regulation. Mm -hmm. And so for that, I mean, so there's got to be a balancing act. This thing has been in place for a while, but we can re um, remove restrictions, which we know we have the power to. We can, but not across the board where you would just lift this mm -hmm. toe. That, that, I'm with Madam Guider 100%. That was the way. Hi, yo. Yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> Absolutely. We vocalize that. Attorney Thompson, uh, do we need to go into executive session? Yes, Madam Chair, for personnel matters. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, four petitioners, do we have a motion to go into executive session? So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Please take 10 minutes and yep. we'll see you back in 10 minutes for petitioners. Okay. Board of Commissioners, do we have any other items to discuss this time? Any, any other discussion? All right, appreciate you all's great uh, work, work session and look forward to our uh, meeting tomorrow. This meeting is adjourned.